Welcome to the Rocky Mountain Artificial Intelligence Interest Group. This was a video of a webinar that we did on April the 11th, 2023, entitled Chat GPT A Deeper Dive. For future meetings, check out our meetup group or check out our website, rmaiig.org. Enjoy. Our final speaker, Mark Rotenberg, is president and founder of the Center for AI and Digital Policy. He's joining us from Washington, D.C. He's a leading expert in data protection, open government, and AI policy, and he serves as an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown Law School. He will be speaking about his organization's March 2023 complaint to the Federal Trade Commission. They are, their complaint says the FTC should order OpenAI, which is the company that uh, has created ChatGPT, to halt the release of GPT models until necessary safeguards are established. These safeguards should be based on the guidance for AI products the FTC has previously established and the emerging norms for the governments of, of AI. So Mark, thank you for joining us. Great, uh, thank you, Dan, and nice to be with all of you. Um, I am a lawyer, I apologize for that. The good news is that uh, it's predicted that the legal profession could be among the most impacted professions uh, by chat GPT. We're not gonna talk about that tonight, but just uh, something to know. Um, I should also say that before I went to law school, and this was a zillion years ago, I was actually a computer programmer and I was uh, very interested in writing game programs, chess and backgammon. And this was back in the early days of AI, it was basically rule-based um, expert systems. It looked like a decision tree. You could actually write a pretty powerful uh, program if you had enough uh, compute and a good algorithm and you could adjust it. And you know, even in that era, before the current era of machine learning, programs were strong enough to beat the world champion. Um, that AI, I felt uh, good about. I understood it. If there was a problem, you could fix it. This new AI really concerns me. And I'll just put it out there before I get into the details of our lawsuit. Everything that you know Ford said a moment ago about how to do good prompts and the role it can play in your business and thinking about how to integrate it, I agree with all that. I think that's uh, good advice. And I think a lot of businesses are going to look for ways to integrate chat GPT um, into their work, and it's already happening. But if you take a step back and you think about what's happening in this moment, something pretty big and profound is taking place. And it's not just sort of the uptake of, um, you know, chat GPT. I, I mean, I remember like, you know, the uptake uh, for the for the commercialization of the internet in the early 1990s, or you know, the iPhone, or even the personal computer revolution going back further. Um, those things seemed you know, exciting, innovative, that created a lot of business opportunity. Um, and they weren't, how to say it, like beyond comprehension. I think we're entering a time right now where we're actually in the beyond comprehension realm. And if you listen to you know a lot of the leading experts in AI, they're saying you know let's slow down. Um, I actually signed a letter a few weeks ago with a bunch of the leading AI experts who said let's take a six month pause and just you know see if we understand fully what we're doing. Now I know tonight's talk isn't a big philosophy thing, so I'm going to stop there on my um, my philosophical take and and jump into the the FTC complaint, but I thought it might be helpful for you to understand where I was coming from. I do have a background in tech. I do understand AI. Um, I've been with it for a long time. Um, I think something different is happening now. And I think it's really important uh, that we understand the, the big picture. Um, the other part of my history is that I actually had quite a bit of success over the years bringing complaints to the Federal Trade Commission when I thought that some of the big tech companies were basically violating what we might call good business practices. 
So about 15 years ago, I went to the FTC uh, regarding uh, Google. When Google tried to roll out its competing social network product to Facebook, it was called Buzz. And what they basically did was to take everyone who was a Gmail user at the time, opt them into Buzz and make their private address book a publicly accessible directory for social network connections. And I wrote to the FTC and I said, that can't possibly be right. You know, people signed up for an email service. You've turned it into a social networking service. People may want Buzz. I mean, no objection to Google doing a social network service, but you shouldn't sign people up to a service. And by the way, it was, of course, terrible for privacy because everybody's email address book, you know, suddenly became publicly accessible. Uh, and the FTC actually agreed with me. And, uh, you know, after a couple of years of, of hard work, there was a big settlement with Google and 20 years of oversight. We didn't get everything uh, we wanted. But I'm telling this story also so you have a little bit of background as to how these things really do work. Uh, we didn't file this complaint with the FTC about OpenAI on a whim. We actually filed it having done, you know, probably a half a dozen similar cases, successful cases with the FTC when companies um, did stuff that just, you know, seemed wrong, uh, however you want to describe it. Um, I'm going to say just a couple words about my organization, and then I'll, I'll jump into the complaint and show you some of the highlights and, and happy to answer any questions um, you might have. We're actually a pretty big uh, research uh, group where we are in uh, 60 countries now around the world. Uh, we just held a conference here in Washington where we released our annual report called AI and Democratic Values. Uh, we're basically trying to evaluate how countries are doing um, in their development of AI policies and practices. We're looking for things like fairness, accountability, transparency, uh, opportunities for, for public input, international AI strategies. And we actually rate and rank countries uh, based on how they're doing. So if you're interested in our you know, assessment of, of the US or, or Japan or, or Colombia or Taiwan, it's all in there. Um, and we're actually pretty proud of that report. A lot of people are looking to it right now as they're developing their own um, national AI strategies. And, you know, that's that's free um, and online and available to anyone who'd like to take a look. Um, we're also um, involved in, in Congress, and this is actually the lead up to um, the FTC complaint. Um, so here's the page, you'll find it on our website, which is caidp.org. Um, my colleague, um, Merva Hycock, um, actually testified before a House committee um, just a few weeks ago. And the, the Congressional Committee um, asked the simple question, and that was, are we ready um, for the AI revolution? And they only had four people on the panel. One of them, by the way, was Eric Schmidt, who you probably know now the CEO of, of uh, Alphabet, uh, formerly Google. Um, no, I'm sorry, he's beyond, he's moved on from Alphabet, but um, still involved, I think. And Marva was on the panel, you know, and, and they asked her the question, like, are we ready for what's happening right now? And I thought she put it very well. She said, you know, we don't have the guardrails in place, the laws we need, the public education or the expertise in government to manage the consequences of the rapid changes that are now taking place. And I would say this is not, you know, being against AI or being against tech. It's actually trying to think about how you establish those guardrails so that as innovation goes forward, you can, you know, protect public safety, avoid risk, avoid catastrophe, because one of the interesting characteristics of, of AI, of course, are, are network effects. Uh, things don't 
necessarily fail locally, they can fail globally with all sorts of uh, uh, repercussions. So we're trying to get people to, to think about these issues in, in a critical way, but we would say also in a constructive way, because if you put the guardrails in, in place, then you see you can go ahead with, with the deployment and the innovation and the business development um, you know, that makes a kind of a long-term prosperity possible. All right, now to the complaint. Um, and I always tell my law school students, you know, that a, a good legal argument is not like a mystery novel. You don't want to have people waiting to the end to figure out what the story was about. Good legal argument actually should set out your key points at the very beginning. And I'm just going to quickly, you know, run through the first page because I think pretty much all of what we're saying in the next 40 or so pages is here. I'll give you a few of the highlights. But we say about OpenAI um, that this is a product that is biased, deceptive, a risk to privacy and public safety. And to me, you know, this is quite serious. It produces outputs that cannot be proven or replicated, right? Super impressive, syntactically correct, you know, I, I agree with what Ford was saying. It's not just like an intern. It's like a really, you know, articulate intern. Now, what you may be reading could be just BS. And if you start trying to get citations, they're complete fabrications. And I think at this point, maybe alarm bells start to go off. The other point we made about this is that there was really no independent assessment that was undertaken prior to deployment. What's fascinating to me, having done a bunch of these complaints in the past, um, is how many of the problems OpenAI itself acknowledged, right? So it's got a systems card and it's got a technical report, and it goes into quite a lot of detail about the risks it has identified so far. And there's a big section which basically says there are a lot of risks we haven't identified. But they say, there's going to be disinformation and influence operations, proliferation of conventional and unconventional weapons, cybersecurity risks. And they actually warn, you know, this is from their system card. They say AI systems will have even greater potential to reinforce entire ideologies, worldviews, truths and untruths, cement them, lock them in for closing, you know, future debate, reflection, and improvement. And because you know, I do a lot of uh, consumer work, I was really struck by the fact that they also basically disclaim all liability for any consequences that may follow. So when you choose to use GPT-4, you know, as cool as it is, you should be aware that the company is telling you you're kind of on your own. And if the reports that you produce and you present, you know, in a board meeting and you make a critical decision on turn out to be entirely wrong. That's not, according to OpenAI's view anyway, that's not the company's fault. That's going to be your fault. And that's something I think everybody needs to keep in mind before they take this big leap. But that's, you know, fine. And people say, well, okay, so you're critical of the, of the product. We get it. Um, but, you know, why is the FTC need to get involved? And do you really want to slow down innovation and all the other you know, criticisms that are sometimes raised about tech regulation. The reason I went to the FTC is I was actually really interested in what they had said over the last few years about companies that are offering AI products and services. This is not a new topic to the FTC. They've been issuing guidelines now for several years. And they actually said, I think three years ago, that AI products should be transparent, explainable, fair, empirically sound while fostering accountability. And we make the simple argument that GPT-4 satisfies none of those requirements, right? It's not transparent. It's not explainable. We have lots of evidence of, of uh, bias. Um, there's no way to establish right now that it's empirically sound. So from our perspective, through the lens of the FTC, this is actually pretty straightforward. 
our expectation that they would act. I'm just going to run quickly through a few of the headings in the complaint. You can read this online. But to get a sense of some of the issues that we raised here, there's a little legal talk at the beginning about, um, you know, open AI. Basically, GPT-4 is now a commercial product because you're buying tokens. They describe it as a product. Talk a bit about some of the governance uh, principles for artificial intelligence. There's already a lot happening globally. Uh, some of these uh, frameworks like the OECD, the U.S. actually has signed up for. So we thought that was important. Uh, universal guidelines for AI, a lot of tech, tech experts have endorsed. Um, we talk a bit about the history of the company. It's it's fascinating. I'm sure a lot of you know this, but it basically you know started as a nonprofit research organization. Um, Elon Musk uh, put some money into it because he was trying to counter what he saw as the commercialization of AI um, by the big tech companies. But of course, over the last several years, OpenAI's business model has changed. So it is now operating uh, like a big tech company. It got a big investment from Microsoft, I think uh, $10 billion, and has also become less transparent. So there's less information for example, about how GPT-4 operates then was made available for GPT-3.5. Um, this is where we basically make the allegation that the company's practices are unfair and deceptive and they violate the FTC statements. Some of the topics we get into include uh, bias is, is one, children's safety is a second, consumer protection, uh, we talk about cybersecurity. Europol uh, two weeks ago actually put out a big report basically warning uh, that ChatGPT was going to, you know, put cyber threat on steroids because there's now a much more sophisticated way not only to analyze attacks, but also to code attacks. So you've got a tool now that can uncover vulnerabilities and actually write the code to exploit the vulnerabilities. We got into um, deception a little bit. There's a whole section about that. Um, I wish I was billing for this. I get paid for all these pages, but I'm not. So it's pretty much volunteer work here. Discussion here on, on uh, privacy, which is important. Um, and then transparency, we basically say they're not about the product, public safety, that's a big topic too. Uh, what I want to do just to get to the end, we've got a section on why we think the FTC should act. Um, he pointed out how these AI experts had called for a six month pause, which was very helpful for us because I was right around the same time we filed uh, the complaint. We've got a lot of other experts talking about some of the some of the risks. There's a bit of legal analysis here for how the FTC can use its authority. But the last thing I just want to jump to and, and I'll stop. Oh, and here are the FTC AI guidelines. So if you're interested in a little bit more detail, you know, what the FTC is, itself has said, you know, be transparent when collecting data, make sure data and models are robust and empirically sound. This is Those are their words. Those aren't our words. Um, that's, you know, that's what they think should happen. Anyway, we get to the end. And what we're basically asking the commission to do is to halt the further commercial deployment of GPT by OpenAI, require the establishment of uh, independent assessment of products, require compliance with their own guidelines, maintain assessment throughout the GPT AI life cycle, and, you know, a few other things uh, basically in line with what the FTC would typically do in these kinds of cases. So I know it's a lot of detail and, uh, you know, um, um, you know, some of the legal analysis there, but it, to me, it actually seems pretty straightforward, uh, which is the Federal Trade Commission has set out guidelines and said to companies, this is what we expect you to do if you're offering an AI product. And OpenAI is not following those guidelines, in our view. 
then we think the FTC needs to act. Uh, we're planning to supplement the complaint and uh, we'll keep you posted. Thank you, Mark. That really, uh, really helped me understand, better understand your complaint and um, all the reasonable points you guys are making. So thank you so much for joining us and explaining that.